you know, in, in the installation and having the single photograph as well, that's just a real photograph. Um, you know, I'm trying to, I don't know, spice things up for the viewer. For two of them, don't put that in. But spice things up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm done. I need lunch. <laughs> No, but I think in Crunchy. both of your works, it's spicy. It's spicy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so the um, project Virtually There that uh, is on display at the gallery, um, it began in 2008, 2009. Um, you know, typically I've been preoccupied with landscape as a subject matter, and uh, I was taking some of the landscape photographs that I've made in previous years and uh, relocating that vantage point in Google Earth. Um, and it began as a bit of a, a kitschy exercise. And I didn't really think of making it into a project at the time. And I started showing some people these images that I had uh, you know, recomposed from my existing images. And um, they thought that there maybe would be something there. And I began to you know, agree with them over time. So, uh, in 2009, I uh, had secured residencies at uh, the Banff Center and at the uh, Gushel Studio in uh, Blairmore in the, the beautiful Crow's Nest Pass. And um, before going there, for about two months before going there, I uh, went online following people's GPS tracks, hikers' GPS tracks, uh, looking at their photographs, looking at uh, images that people had you know, uploaded uh, to, to blogs, and also um, finding ideal vantage points in Google Earth, places along uh, the mountain where I could make you know, an in interesting vista. And uh, then with all this information, I, I made uh, eight by 10 work prints and printed out maps, um, took the GPS tracks and uploaded them to uh, you know, a, a GPS unit and uh, went out into the actual landscape to kind of reenact these kind of pseudo performances that I had done online. And uh, over the course of, I guess, six or eight weeks, uh, shot the project following um, in, in the steps of, of people that had come before me. And there were kind of two criteria. I mean, first of all, the conditions had to be good in order to make an interesting photograph. But also, uh, the data in Google Earth had to be of a, a reasonable uh, quality uh, for there to be an interesting companion image there. So uh, I ended up taking a lot more pictures and obviously editing down to, to you know, the images that are uh, in the space now. The project is called Pierre Paysage, which in French means stone landscape. And it started back in the summer of 2009, uh, while I did a residency along with a number of other artists at Skull, which is an artist-run center in Montreal. And we had set out to work with the center's uh, archives, their programming archives, as material for new work. And this was a different uh, method for me to work with, but uh, I was interested in looking at a lot of the photo documentation of the exhibitions and thinking about how when the images and the writing and some video documentation of the work, when that is all that remains of an exhibition, how does that uh, substitute for an actual experience of the exhibition. So I gravitated towards images of uh, a show of maquettes small models that were made by Montreal-based artist and architect Catherine Lapierre. One project I particularly gravitated towards uh, was the stone, Pierre, and it was based on a project where she tried to map Parc La Fontaine, which is in the center of Montreal, but she wanted the stone to act as a representation of, of the entire park, so it was based on one stone that she found there. And so I liked using this as a metaphor, focusing in on this one project as a representation of the archive, of 20 years of programming archives. And so I set out to try to recreate a paper maquette of the stone based on the documentation and some, some online notes that she had made, made as well. And so I was trying to look for different sources of, of, to, to guide my recreation of this maquette. And unfortunately, it didn't work out because it was a very complex model made up of over a hundred pieces, but what I did result in was sort of the stony landscape made up of the same number of pieces, which I then actually sent to her by mail. And I was interested in trying to create this dialogue with this artist, and I'd never worked in this way where I used another artist's 
uh, project as a departure point for new work for myself. Um, but I did get a chance to meet her briefly, and uh, and I never felt like that project was resolved over that summer, so I kind of would always come back to it and wasn't particularly interested in trying to ultimately make the stone, recreate the stone in its original state, uh, or as close as possible to, to the way that it looked in the photographs, but how I could work with the maquette pieces themselves. And I was interested in deconstructing the maquette and seeing what, what kinds of sort of, I guess you can see them as alternate landscapes, um, as photographs. Well, in terms of um, landscape photography, I mean, there's a tradition of, uh, especially in the topographic landscape, the mountains, for example, uh, of you know revisiting the same locations. I mean, uh, everybody who hikes a trail, uh, you know, has seen these signs where it's like viewpoint. It tells you where to go and to take a photograph. And uh, the people who establish these trails, you know, are the ones that kind of guide future generations through uh, you know, these 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 belvederes, through these these uh, vistas. And um, before working on the, the project virtually there. Um, I had spent a lot of time photographing in the mountains, and I came across the photographs of the Vox family from uh, Philadelphia back to Pablo Rodriguez mentions in the, uh, the text on uh, the exhibition. And uh, it was no coincidence, you know, I, I'd already made my own photographs from uh, these same locations, and it was no coincidence that their photographs from over 100 years prior were practically identical. They were black and white, but they were from the same points of view. And uh, this was because they were the ones that employed you know, the Swiss and Austrian guides to come and establish these routes in the mountains. And there's also this tradition of repeat photography. So there are, have been a number of photographers in the last 30, 40 years who go to the same sites to make photographs you know, today or in a contemporary time of something that had been photographed in the past. And I think uh, yeah, I mean, we could also talk about the whole idea of veracity in photography and this whole idea of truth and uh, how, you know, basically since the invention of photography, you know, uh, within 10 years, uh, not even with less than 10 years, I mean, photographers were going to uh, great extremes to doctor their images. And, uh, you know, I think the whole idea of truth in photography could be thrown out the window. And I think uh, it's interesting to find new ways to kind of revisit that argument. Well, for me, it's a very different process. Um, because I'm not a landscape photographer. My approach to photography is more performance-based and studio-based. And so for me, my interest has always been in the body and in repetition and the body as a mechanical tool for production, especially when it comes to, to art making. And so I've always been interested in repeated movements and in this case, in, in Pierre Paysage, in working with the same pieces and in, in rearranging uh, pieces in order to make a new image. And so I think it is through through repeated processes that you make new discoveries, and, and that's the, the process that I like to work through, um, especially when you, you reach dead ends. And there, there were many times in the studio in photographing this, I would have to think, okay, did I, did I already take this photograph? Or is there a new or different way that I can arrange this? Because um, there were times where it just it would become redundant, and then trying to, to resolve the fact, okay, well, is redundancy necessarily a bad thing? Um, so I guess for me, the the repetition is a means of like exhausting an idea and trying to to push through it uh, in order to make new discoveries visually. I think that there, you know, in terms of my process as well, there was this sense of repetition, which is, I think, in in your project, it maybe comes to the fore more, but in mine, I mean, I shot, I don't know, uh, you know a thousand exposures, and it, it was this kind of like, it was, it was very formulaic as well. I mean, I had, uh, you know, the, the proof print, I had the GPS track, all I, I, I mean, I didn't even have to turn my brain on, really. I mean, I, I had already marked out the route, and um, so, uh, but a lot of that, you know, through the edit, a lot of that got, got cut out. But I find this, this idea, I think transcends both the projects. It cuts across both the projects. Mm -hmm. That um, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of uh, through repetition, doing the same thing over to kind of um, refine and continually build on uh, something. Mm -hmm. I think what um, what I was trying to do with the photographs in this project and the video. I mean, the title of the video, "Best General View." You know, this sense of um, 
these locations that have been photographed over and over and over by so many different people and deliberately and otherwise. It's kind of like a testing ground, you know, you kind of, you go to this place that it's, you know, it's like photographing the Eiffel Tower or the Empire State Building or, you know, the whatever. Um, you kind of go there and you try to make the best possible image that you yourself can, can make in that place, you know, but there's so much baggage at those sites um, that it's, it's quite difficult. And I mean, I, you know, I mentioned that I'd shot really a lot and most of it was just totally scrapped like in the first round because um, they were, you know, cliche images or they weren't, you know, good enough. And they, they didn't measure up to, you know, what I thought I could make in that site, you know, but. Uh, Bourdieu writes about this where, um on a honeymoon, a couple takes a photo in front of the Eiffel Tower, and the Eiffel Tower represents Paris. So you don't no longer need images throughout Paris. It's, you just have this one symbol. So it comes back to this idea of synecdoche, where this one particular object represents the whole landscape. <laughs> no, but I like it. That's, uh, <laughs> because, because you know, in in uh, the project that I did before, virtually there. It, this project I called Peak. Uh, you know, I was photographing these, um, and it, it comes back to also, you know, the group of seven. It's like the idealized view, yeah. whereas, you know, industry lies three degrees out to the right or the left of the frame. It's like they're selecting this, this particular view of the wilderness, and I think that's what I was kind of trying to do with these images as well, is to show something that's like idealized and sublime and not show the Icefields Parkway, which was just out of the shot, right? Um, so to kind of, I don't know, but a majority of the a majority of the group of seven artists were kids from the city, and well, this is it. Yeah, and exactly. Most of them were just uh, painting images that were just out off of the the train station. Yeah, I mean, they, they, <laughs> I mean, they had a car, you know, the Algoma Rail. They they put them up in a car and they threw them out into the the, the wilderness. But they had, you know, a place to uh, sleep comfortably at night, and you know, a lot of the paintings were painted from you know the cottages of their benefactors. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, so I think that, that they're, I don't even remember where this kind of all started. I think it's all just part of the photographic discourse at this stage. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're so deep into that that, um, you know, you, if you look at even an Andreas Gursky picture, you know, it looks like it's a documentary style photograph and it's so heavily doctored. Um, you know, or Jeff Wall as well, it's the same thing. It looks like a deci the decisive moment playing out in front of you, but it's captured, you know, with an 8x10 camera, it's blown up huge and everything is totally crisp and perfect. Uh, I mean, I think it's, uh, we all just have our individual ways of dealing with this. You've got to start somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. So. And I think it's really easy to essentialize this idea of truth as an undoctored image, as something that's very, very objective. But I think photography uh, lends itself so easily to manipulation. I mean, there's different levels of quote unquote doctoring an image to make it not so truthful. But uh, I think it's really idealized that there is a, an objective view out there, but I don't think that's necessarily true. All images are constructs. I think, you know, yeah, there, there's a panorama in the show where I stitched two negatives together and you can't see the scene. So, you know, good on me. I know how to use Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of people that don't out there. So if you can't see, you know, the brushworks, if you can't, if you don't reveal that, and some people do that deliberately and that's okay too. But, um, you know, I think if it's, if it's smooth enough, then get seduced into it, be seduced, you know, that, that, it was about seduction with the group of seven as well, it was believing that Canada was this untouched landscape of pure wilderness from coast to coast, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and whereas that's, that wasn't the case back then, and it's certainly not the case now, and um, so you just kind of like take your own take on it. I think we have very different methodologies and approaches to photography, mm -hmm. but in terms of the, the content, in this case, it works quite well. We both shoot with four five. There are similarities. <laughs> because it is a very, it is a, it, it is a very slow yeah. process. It is a very, you know, uh, time-consuming methodological tool to use. It's very different than using just a plain machine camera. And I think it was important for my project. It was definitely important for your project mm -hmm. as well to have that. And, you know, for me, it was a way of engaging with the history of photographing these places. And, for you, it's you know the fidelity of capturing that that landscape, that manufactured, created landscape. Mm -hmm.
Not manufactured. <laughs> <laughs> Copyright on Dertinsky. Oh, he's going to sue us now. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, sitting down and doing this with me.